The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Kim Hachia. On today's segment, we're going to be learning about e-bikes. Exercising is an activity we should all do. I'm Kristen Stowes, and my guest, Julie Gibson, will help us take a deep dive into the water to learn the benefits of water aerobics. There are many beautiful and interesting spots which are within a one day's drive of Lincoln. And it's a great time this fall to get out and see some of these interesting areas around Lincoln. One of those is a memorial garden in Humboldt, Nebraska. Stay tuned to see and hear about this interesting garden. This and more on today's Live and Learn. On September 15th, Lincoln lost a legend. Lita Powell Drake was a pace setter and pioneer in the broadcasting industry. Aging Partners has been blessed to have Lita serve as one of our Live and Learn co-hosts for the past 10 years. In this month's show, our October 2021 installment, we honor Lita and, in an effort to pay tribute to her lasting legacy, we invite you to view an encore telecast of her final Live and Learn appearance. We hope you enjoy it as we once again remember, honor, and say thank you to the one and only Lita of Lincoln. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake, and we're going to be talking about the Lincoln Community Playhouse. And Maury Enders, the executive director of the Community Playhouse, is fortunately with us today. So I think you'll really appreciate that. And now what's happening with the COVID situation with regards now to coming to the Playhouse? Sure. Well, Lita, you know, um, our business model is to put as many people into the same room at the same time and we all breathe on each other, which is terrible <laughs> for COVID, right? <laughs> so we were one of the businesses shut down basically for 18 months. We're in the theater business and the performing arts, kind of the first business to close, last one to open. And that's where we find ourselves. So right as we, we prepared a season, a full season of shows, right as we're getting ready to open, COVID starts to spike again. So what can we do? So we put in some new COVID protocols that are based on Broadway protocols. Uh -huh. So um, in order to get into the Playhouse as an audience member, you're now going to have to show your your vaccination card, oh, that you're okay. fully vaccinated. And then you're still gonna wear a mask over your mouth and nose while you're in the building. If you're unvaccinated, you can still attend, but you have to show us proof that you have a negative COVID test within 72 hours of the play. And then you're still going to have to wear your mask over your nose and your mouth while you're in the building. This is all designed to make, yeah. to, you know, so that we can still have theater but we can do it as safely as possible. So we, you know, theater is, an, is a group collaboration. Let us have a collaboration with the audience so we all can watch theater and still be safe. Yeah, well, uh, how long has the Playhouse been in Lincoln, Nebraska? The Playhouse has been around 76 years, yes. And despite my gray hair, I was not here for all of them, Lita. I was only here for 11. <laughs> 76 years, we started in a bathhouse, moved to the old synagogue, and then finally to our building on uh, uh, 56th Street uh, in 1972. Ah, and what was the first show of the season? Our first show for the season is The Fantastics, ah, ah. right? It's the world's longest running musical. The original run in New York City lasted 44 years, but you only get two weekends to see it in Lincoln at the Lincoln Community Playhouse. So The Fantastics is a charming musical about a young man and a young woman whose fathers put up a wall so that they can't fall in love, which makes them fall oh. in love. And it turns out the fathers <laughs> wanted them in love in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the fantastic. It is a fantastic thing. <laughs> uh, what's on stage for October? In October, we have a play called Calendar Girls. Oh. And now this is a comedy. It's based on a true story. A group of women in an English uh, women's group, like a PEO club, are doing a calendar. And to raise money for uh, the local hospital, they decide, to, they decide to spice it up. And so instead of pictures of rural churches, they're going to get naked. Oh, yeah. So they're, they decide to do a naked calendar and it makes so much money and so much publicity that in the true story, it's made over like, like 10 million pounds for can, uh, blood cancer research. So it's a funny play. It's also a great uh, play about, <laughs> about self-image and sisterhood. 
Uh, what's coming up for November then? Uh, in November, oh, we have, oh. oh yeah, this is cool because this is a special event. We have Dick Terhune, oh, who oh. Is, is one of our legends, you know, mm. kind of our Hall of Famers. Oh, yeah. Lita, you are also a legend, a Hall of Famer oh. at the Playhouse. Oh. <laughs> so Dick Terhune lives in Connecticut. He's a voice artist. He actually makes his living with his voice, and he's a voice of cartoons and things. So he's coming back to the Playhouse to do a Christmas carol. Oh. He is playing everybody. Oh. Yeah, so he's Scrooge, he's Tiny Tim, he's all the three ghosts. He's everybody in the whole play. How many how many characters is Oh, it's like 36, 40 characters. And he does them all. He does them all. And he remembers his lines. He remembers all of his lines. <laughs> Especially God bless us everyone. <laughs> but you're gonna have two Christmas shows, are you not? That is correct. Uh -huh. Yep. So Dick Terhune with a Christmas Carol kind of ushers in the holiday season in November. And then in December we have our Penguin Project, which is gonna be Elf Jr which is based on the Will Ferrell movie that a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. know and love. Um, it's our Penguin Project, so this yeah. is our show where all the roles are played by children with special needs partnered with peer mentors. So it's going to be a lot of fun and beautiful, and always with the Penguin Project, there's a lot of heart on that stage. How do these children come over there if they're impaired in some way? I mean, are they brought over there? Well, they, they have, guided? they have, we have, they are, the Penguin Project families are the, some of the greatest people you'd ever want to meet. They're so supportive of their kids, and they get them there to the, to the playhouse. We have kids who have autism and traumatic brain injury and Down syndrome and intellectual uh, disabilities and, and they do such a great job and our mentors are the most empathetic young people you'd ever want to meet. I mean, if you want to see something that gives you optimism about where the oh, world's going, come to the Penguin Project. All right, and in January coming up, uh, uh, what's that all about? Oh yeah, it's called Every Brilliant Thing. Another interesting show this is also a one-person show this one is being done by ashley kobza who is uh, one of our mm -hmm. our actors who also is actually a director in the penguin project this is a british show it's about a, it's a one woman telling a story about her life and when she was a child her mother tried to commit suicide so as a child she starts to write up a list of every brilliant thing and that's pretty so like every wonderful thing that makes life worth living and, and, and so as the audience comes in, Ashley will be talking to the audience and she'll be giving them cards with like a number and it'll say like 100 ice cream. And so as she's telling the, the story, she, she says, for instance, on the list, like 100. And whoever has 100 yells out, ice cream. And so the audience works with her to create the list and it's, it's gonna be dynamite. <laughs> What's on the agenda for March? In March, Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters now this is a, a, a children's show. It's gonna have adults and children in it. It is based on a story by John Steptoe, and it is based on, on an African legend, an African story, and it's about uh, uh, the prince of the, of the, in the area says, uh, I wanna get married, so send your daughters to me and see who will be my bride, who will be chosen as my bride. And Mufaro has two beautiful daughters. One is beautiful, on the inside and outside, one only on the outside. Mm. And they each take this journey to the royal city, and one of them, it turns out, is truly the beautiful daughter and is chosen as the bride. It's kind of an African take of Cinderella. And, all, and it oh, is yeah. our first all-black cast, so it's a really a beautiful story, and I hope that, that folks enjoy it. All right, what's up in May then? Well, if you've noticed, most of the things that I've been saying so far have been kind of smaller scale shows. Yeah. And then we're going to blow it out big in, in May with Joseph the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Um, this is, a, we're going to have, I mean, let's hope, we're going to have tons of people on stage, lots of people in the audience. It's, uh, it's, it's just fun. It's a 90 minute music almost like a living music video on the stage. And it's about Joseph and his coat and his brothers and how he goes and ends up becoming like the leader of Egypt uh, from the Old Testament. But it's got, it's got its Old Testament storyline, but oh. it's got country music and uh, Elvis music. The Pharaoh is Elvis. Elvis? Yeah. The Pharaoh, Our Elvis? Yeah, uh, the Pharaoh is Elvis in this. Yeah, so it's a lot of fun and just crazy stuff to end the season. Who makes these decisions as to which plays you're going to do? Well, do you think it's a good season? 
Fabulous. I, I make those decisions. I oh, make sure oh, how you yeah. felt about it before I told you. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so what I do is I, I look at, at, at various things, uh, you know, formulas and ideas and what's new and what's, what's trending. Mm -hmm. and, and I put that together. And then I have kind of a little consultation group that I send scripts to and say, hey, what do you think about this one and that one? Are you an actor? I, am, I used to be an actor, but that was a long time ago. And you don't do it anymore. No, I don't well, do it Once anymore. an actor, I felt always uh, an actor. Well, I act all the time, really, yeah, but well, not on stage. Yeah, well, in many ways you should do yeah, it. Yeah. But I, I'm surprised that there you know, might be uh, a part that say, oh, well, I, I, I can do that. Well, you know, Lita, here's, here, as the leader of the community theater, I think that if I were to take a role, then all I'm doing oh. is taking a role away from someone else. And I want everybody to be able to participate. And the more people who participate at the Playhouse, the better I feel. Okay. Anything else you want to know? We just have a few minutes left that people should know about what, you know, what's coming on to the Playhouse. Oh, sure. Well, I do want, uh, we have, um, um, this year we've initiated a free performance for every play. Oh. So, so in order, again, we're working, trying to make sure that our community playhouse is everyone's community playhouse. Oh. And we're trying to soften the doors. It's a phrase about, about making it so people feel like they can come into the playhouse and it's theirs. So sometimes people can't come because of the ticket price. Although we have to have ticket prices because we have to keep the play, yeah. play going. Uh, but um, we wanted to offer a free show for every show. So for the Fantastics, it's actually going to be a Frontline Heroes performance. Anyone who works in the hospital, the grocery stores can come to the th show for free. And then after that, it's going to be one free show. Um, if people can go to lincolnplayhouse.com and find out when those shows will be. And they just make a reservation and come and they can, everybody can come. Are, are you open all year round or just a portion of the year? Oh, all, all year, all spaced out throughout the year. So every show we just talked about will have a free performance. Um, uh, the, the Penguin Project with Elf Jr., our free performance is called Exceptional Family Night where anyone in the community who has a family member who has special needs, the whole family can come to the play for free. Oh, that is so special. Yeah. <laughs> the Playhouse goes back a long way. Where were they before they are in the current situation? Sure, there? well, you where? know, as, as the Lincoln it's Circlet Theater, that was a circlet. circlet, that was a, I know it sounds like those little squares gum, yeah, right? Yeah. They're like chiclets, yeah. the Circlet Theater. Um, was in the Lindell Hotel. Oh yes, I went. I went to one of those All a right. long time ago. The Lindell Hotel. Yeah, oh. yeah. And they called it Circlet because they sat in a circle yeah, evidently right. and read the plays. And then that developed into the Community Playhouse, and we were in a bathhouse, which seems the weirdest thing <laughs> in the world. You know, you, you show your ticket and you get a towel on the way in. I, I don't know. Uh, on that note, we're going to have. <laughs> oh end no, it. that's how we're ending. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is Maury at the Lincoln Community Playhouse, and we love we love it. No, oh, we love you, Lita. Well, well, thank you, thank you very much. Where's the money? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, our appreciation to Maury very much, and we'll, we'll be back next time. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75 percent increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Hi everybody, welcome to Live and Learn. My name is Kim Hachia. Hey, today we're not in the studio, we're in a store, a bike shop in Midtown Lincoln. And we're talking to Rick Dockhorn, who is um, who works here. And he, Rick is kind of the bike maven of Lincoln. Everybody knows him. He's really a big leader in the bike community. He is the cover boy for the <laughs> October um, quarterly um, issue of Living Well magazine. And we're going to be talking today about e-bikes. And uh, we just think they're cool. And uh, um, a lot of um, older people are interested in e-bikes. So we're going to just be talking about e-bikes, why people might want to buy one. So Rick, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. So Rick, give me a little definition of what an e-bike is. So an e-bike, it stands for electric bike, meaning that it has a, a motor and it has a battery. And on the bikes that we have here, these are what they call pedal assist bikes. Okay. So you have to pedal the bike, but the motor assists you. 
and it assists you in different degrees. They all have uh, several different degrees of assist on them. But the main issue is that they are, there's a battery like here, a battery like there, a motor here, a motor there. So they're electric motor driven bikes. So the bike won't just take off on its own, right? It will not. It will not. So there's no throttle on it. There is say. no throttle on these bikes. Okay. Oh, but some do have. There are bikes out there that do have throttles. Okay. We don't sell those right. kind. Right. So why would somebody want an e-bike? Well, so you're at a point in your life where you like to ride. It's not as easy as it used to be. And you still want to continue to ride. Uh, there's a phrase out there that e-bikes put the fun back into riding. And so with that assist that they have, uh, it allows you to go out and ride with your friends, stay up with your friends, um, and still have a good time and not be exhausted. So Rick, if I was interested in buying an e-bike, what are some questions you would ask me about how I want to use the bike? And then what should I know about the bike? Well, those would be the first question I would ask you is how you intended to use the bike. Are you going to ride mainly on paved streets? You're going to ride on our city's limestone trails and paved streets. Are you going to ride gravel? Uh, are you going to mountain bike? Because there's e-bikes for all those different categories. So once we have that figured out, then I would go and look at the different bikes that best address that type of riding. Uh, say you're just going to ride a casual bike or casual trails around town. This would be a good bike here uh, because it's yeah. a very upright riding position. Uh, very comfortable ride. It's probably the most comfortable bike that we have here. If you wanted something that needed a more aggressive tire, we'd look at one like this one here with a little bit more aggressive tire to it. Mm -hmm. If you're going to ride gravel roads, those kind of things. Um, and at some point then, uh, it's going to factor in there, how long are you going to ride? Are you talking going out for uh, a 10 mile ride, a 20 mile ride, whatever it is? Because the riding conditions and the riding environment are going to determine how long you're going to be able to ride with that battery. Okay, so if I was going to do one of those, you know, those bike ride across Nebraska type mm -hmm. situations, would this be, um, could I use a bike like that in that situation? You can. You like 75 miles a day sometimes. Well, the ones I'm familiar with, they usually go 50, 60. Okay. Uh, and most bikes, if you run them on a low assist setting and you use the gears on the bike like you should, mm -hmm. then you can probably get 50 or 60 miles out of a battery. Okay. So the more assist you use, the less battery you have available. Okay. And that's going to determine how long you can ride. Okay. And then how long does it take to recharge batteries? I'm sure some are, you know, they have a different length of time, right? They, they do. Most of them for a full, when they're fully discharged to a full recharge, will be about four and a half hours. Oh, okay. That's a, that would be like, you know, mm -hmm. long lunch yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. If you're just yeah, topping yeah, yeah, it yeah. up, it, it could be as little as 30 minutes. Right. So on these bikes... Obviously, this one has the bar here, mm -hmm. and that one doesn't. So explain what, what the difference is there. Back in the day, you used to have men's bikes and women's bikes. Now we have step-over bikes, and we have step-through bikes. And the difference being that when you have this one, you have to throw your leg over the seat. When you have this style or that style, you can step through to okay. get on the seat. Okay. And so um, is there one style that's more popular than the other? I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say the step through are becoming more popular with people, uh, especially guys that have hip issues. Right. They've always been more popular with the women. Right. But anybody that has an issue getting on the bike, the step throughs are better. So do the batteries make the bikes a lot heavier? And, the, and if so, does that mean I, it might not work on my bike rack for my car? Uh, uh, interesting question. Yes, the batteries add a considerable amount of weight. The motor adds weight. Oh, okay. They have to change the bike design. On a few bikes that we've tested, though, most racks will handle up to like a 45 or 50 pound bike. Okay. If you remove the battery, most batteries are between 10 and 12 pounds. Mm. That usually puts you in a range that would work on your bike rack. Oh, I see. Okay, that sounds good. And they do recommend that you remove the battery when you're transporting them. Right. So I don't have to worry about the battery catching on fire, like with the Chevy Volts or whatever those... <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I've not had any that I know of Yeah. ever had that happen to. Yeah. I just recently saw somewhere, and I meant to look it back up, that apparently in some new legislation, they're talking about trying to maybe um, give you a tax credit for buying 
find an e-bike because of sort of the environmental aspects of commuting if you use mm -hmm. an e-bike, which would be really great, I think. It'd be great. Yeah. Uh, I think it's an idea that's been kicked around several years. Yeah. And hasn't, quite, uh, hasn't right got to the top of the hill no, yet. No, it hasn't, yeah. It hasn't yeah. risen to the top of the list. So it'd be a great idea, though. I know. I know. So are you seeing more sales of these bikes now? Yes. Are they becoming unpopular? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like everything else when they're first introduced. Price is the biggest objection. Uh, now, as prices start to come down, and initially all things new are rejected, and people think about, hey, that is a good idea. And so the two finally meet at a happy place, and we sell bikes. Do you think there's kind of a stigma among some people saying, oh, you're cheating? Yes. And there then is. how do you get past that? The easiest way to get past it is to have them ride the bike. That, that is by far the easiest because I can explain to you why you're not cheating, but until you go out and ride the bike, you aren't convinced uh, because you still have to put out the effort or the bike doesn't go. Right. All it does is multiply your effort. Oh, okay. One of my friends, um, when I told her I was doing this segment, she said, oh, I don't think those bikes are legal on the trails, but they're legal, right? They are. Absolutely. Legislation changed uh, two or three years ago. Good, good. So the one thing we haven't talked about is one thing that you probably really do need for this bike, and that's a helmet, right? Always need a helmet. Anytime you're going to ride a bike, you need a helmet. Good. It's just, I don't know, to me, it's just good sense. Uh, they've saved my life on a couple of occasions, so that's good sense to me. Good, good. That's good to know. What else do I need to know about these bikes, Rick? Um, of course, price is always an issue, or always a subject more so to others than some. And there's a wide variety of prices out there. It just depends on what kind of bike you're looking for. Uh, knowing where you want to ride is probably the, the biggest concern. And knowing the kind of riding uh, position you want to have is a, another concern. Because uh, some of the bikes are gonna be what they call flat bars. Mm -hmm. Some will have drop bars like the, the racing bikes, like that one over there, they'll have uh, drop bars on them. So just depending about that, it's, it's just in a conversation more about how you want to use the bike. And then from that, we can get enough information to direct you towards the bike that might work for you. Great. So Rick, if you're somebody who maybe hasn't ridden a bike in a long time and you have a little bit of apprehension about it, how, mm -hmm. do, you, how do you get started again? And how do you get over that sort of fear about riding the bike? And what, you know, will these kind of bikes be helpful in that? As far as getting used to riding a bike again, the only way you get used to riding a bike again is to ride a bike again. And if you have uh, apprehensions about riding an e-bike, I would put you on a non-e-bike mm -hmm. to start okay. with, just to overcome that and get uh, reacquainted with your balance, handling, all those kind of things. And then we could progress up to the e-bike because there, there will be a difference when you ride an e-bike, they're heavier, they still steer about the same, but they are heavier. Uh, and when you pedal and you have the, the boost on there, you're gonna feel it. So it's just those kind of things that you just need to be aware are going to happen. Right, and if you're like me and your first bike was a Schwinn Varsity way back there in the dark ages, and yeah. that bike felt like it weighed about a thousand pounds anyway, yep. it may not feel that different to me. <laughs> Although it had those really skinny little tires. It did. Yeah, so. It did. And so do the thicker tires or the wider tires, I guess, um, help with balance and all that? I don't know if they help so much with balance. It just depends on the person. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger, wider tires also will give you a more comfortable ride. Okay. It makes some people feel more secure because you don't have to worry about cracks in the pavement, cracks in the sidewalk, drain gutters, those kind of things. Right. Um, but the, the biggest advantage of is you get a little nicer ride, depending on the air pressure you keep in the tire. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's because they're more bouncy and... Just bigger volume. Right. Yeah. Right. And then I noticed that there's actually different saddle types here. This is, you know, I think mm -hmm. of this as more of a, I don't know, racing kind of saddle, and that is more of a comfort saddle. That's a good description. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't go necessarily racing, but it is more athletic, I think, is a term they use. Yeah. I don't know, that looks more painful to me, but. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's another segment. Right. But this is obviously gonna be more comfortable because this particular bike, you're, get, you're setting straight up right. on it. 
Right. This one here, you have more of a forward lean to it. Uh -huh. And so you factor those things in and that really helps determine the comfort of the seat. Right. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty cool. On this bike, obviously here's the, the battery, the battery, mm -hmm. but you know, you've got this you have a rack on the back. On it, so you yep. could put like a little basket or something, I guess. Yeah. So People, if you're going to use it for commuter, that yeah. would be good. Yeah. That would be excellent. Um, I imagine that that these would be something that a bike thief might be interested in. So you would probably want to have some fairly sturdy lock situation. With Locks bike. are always a good idea. Yeah. And a good lock. Yeah. And, you know, regardless of what you paid for your bike, you paid whatever it is and you want to preserve that. Right. And so we always encourage people to invest in good locks. Right. And not those little cheapy cable kind anymore. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. I've had a couple of friends who've had some really nice bikes stolen off campus or in yeah. downtown Lincoln. And it's, it's just heartbreaking you it know, is. that they lose these bikes that they love and that, yeah. you know, that were very, um, you know, personal to them. I've had it happen to me too. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, that would just crush me. They, um, yeah, and both of these friends, um, one of one of my friends is not very tall, and so her bike was kind of a small bike, sure. and so she, we basically joked about, well, if we if you see a very large person riding a very small <laughs> bike, you know what yeah. happened there. So, yeah. which does make me think these bikes do come in sizes, don't they? They do. So, generally speaking, they're going to come in a small, medium, large, extra large. Okay. There are some bikes that'll come in an extra small and an extra large. Okay. But as a rule, it's small, medium, large. And that refers to the height of the person as opposed to the weight of the person. <laughs> so obviously you would take a taller bike than I would. Okay. Because you're taller than I am. Yeah. And so it refers to your height, but we also have to look at not only what your inseam is, are you long, is your torso long, oh, is yeah. your torso short? because the, to sell somebody a bike based on their leg length doesn't do them justice most of the time. Right, because if, you're, if you have short legs but a long torso right. and, you, see, get a, what I and you get too long of a bike, mm -hmm. you're not gonna be very comfortable. Right. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that so you wanna get the bike sized properly. Right, and that's something that a good bike shop can help you do. It is. Correct? It is. Right, so you wanna talk to somebody who knows about bikes and can help you I think it's the best thing to Pick do. The right model. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I do too. I'm really glad that we came here today because it really gave me an idea about what, if I want to buy a bike like this, what I would be looking for and, you know, who to talk to because you're obviously, you know, your stuff. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't, you don't personally ride these very often, do you? The e-bikes? Yeah. Uh, no, my wife does though. That's her only bike is an e-bike and I've ridden it on occasion. And it's and I've test ridden all these in the shop here. Uh, it's it's in the future. It's in my future. Yeah. 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 You know, if nothing else, just because it's fun. So Rick, you told me you've been biking for over six, 60 years. Sixty years. Yeah. yeah. Which is pretty amazing. But it it also says to me that bicycling is like a life lifelong passion pursuit. Mm -hmm. It's great exercise. Mm -hmm. Are these? And so these allow people to continue to do that, right? Yes. And I, as you age, it's important to stay active. You got to keep the blood moving. And I want to get that fresh air into your lungs because uh, it's invigorating as well to go out for a bike ride. And it doesn't have to be hundreds of miles. Oh, yeah. If you go out for five or 10 miles, that's a great ride because mm -hmm. you're out there, the blood circulating, you're moving your joints, you're keeping your joints uh, loosened up. Uh, muscles are working. It's just a good overall, all overall body experience. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I, I see people riding the bikes all the time on the trails near me, and I always think, wow, mm -hmm. that looks really fun. So maybe someday. I think you should try it someday. Maybe someday I'll try it. Yeah. So anyway, well, thanks, Rick. I think we're out of time. And uh, I want to remind our viewers that it's never too late to live and learn about a new passion, bicycling. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. What forms of exercise have you tried? I'm Kristen Stowes, and my personal favorite is water exercise. 
My guest, Julie Gibson, is Aquatic Supervisor at Madonna Proactive. She is here to fill us in on the benefits of water aerobics. Julie, welcome to Live and Learn. Hi, thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you here today. Please tell us a little bit about your background in the fitness field. Okay, I am from Nebraska. I went to college here and then I moved down to Houston and worked in the medical center, Methodist Hospital, and I was down there for 10 years um, and decided to move back when I started a family and I was a, I'm a personal trainer. I'm a certified aquatic fitness instructor and I have been at Madonna Proactive for 16 years now and love it. You are a very busy, busy gal, I know that. <laughs> Over the years, you have definitely seen the benefits of water exercise in particular. Let's put up a graphic and I'll have you highlight okay. some of the points that make water exercise so beneficial. Okay. Yes, um, anytime you use the water, you have resistance both directions, back and forth. And so that will increase muscle strength. Adding um, weights, any equipment would also benefit your muscle strengthening. Um, building endurance, anytime you do it longer, you're gonna build up your endurance and your stamina. Uh, increased flexibility, any stretching, any lengthening of your limbs, that will also help with your flexibility. And doesn't water allow you to do that? Yes. 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 And that is what the next one is. The low impact of the exercise in the water takes so much off of your joints. Mm -hmm. So that makes mm -hmm. a big difference when you're in the water. Um, that's probably one of the main reasons people come to the water is if you have a knee, hip, shoulder replacement, it just takes a lot of the impact off your joints. Very joint friendly. Yes. yes. Very. I, I like that very a lot. Much. Mm -hmm. Relieve stress and decrease, decrease anxiety. That is, any form of exercise will do that, so. <laughs> but water is so soothing. But, <laughs> water is so soothing and relaxing, and I think you just, it's kind of like people tell me when they're swimming laps. I mean, and they're in the water. It's so peaceful under the water. Absolutely. Yeah. And you do burn calories, is this? We do, yes. People ask me this all the time. If I take an exercise class, how many calories am I burning? Uh -huh. And it really depends on your intensity, how much you put into the exercise, okay. how long you do it, okay, and um, just the speed maybe if you're going a little bit faster. So all that comes into play when you're burning calories. But I would say when they ask me, it can be anywhere with those three principles, anywhere from 300 to 500 calories. And so. I would think that would surprise many people. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. You do more than you realize. You don't realize yes. until you get out of the water how much you've really done. <laughs> exactly, yes. yeah, and that's a good point because uh -huh. under the water, the body seems to want to float more. Uh -huh. And so if you have a little more cellulite, you will float more. And if you have more muscle mass, you're going to sink. So a lot okay. of people say, why can't I get my feet down? Or why do I float so much? And that's a, a big issue with it. Oh, because, interesting. Yes. Okay, so. never thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I call them either floaters or sinkers. And most of the people will know that as soon as they get in the water if you're a floater or sinker. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And this is a very popular activity for all ages. And I find that very refreshing too. Yes, it's very popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, if as we get older, I tell people, I think we're all gonna end up in, in the water with arthritis, with all the joint problems we're seeing, mm -hmm. replacements, mm -hmm. just everybody's just really trying to mm -hmm. put off surgery as long as possible. Yeah. So they'll get in the water and That's try right. to do all the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Cause you can do so much more in the water than you can on land. Even though I'm for land for the weight bearing, mm -hmm. I think I tell my classes, mix it up. Mm -hmm. Mix, mix it, up. it up. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree with that too. So specific exercises you can do in the water without Equipment? Absolutely. I tell people work on angles. So if okay. you're going to get in the water and you're just starting, you say, I'm not a swimmer. I just want to walk on my own. I don't want to do classes. I tell them to walk forward, backwards, sideways, one way and then the other. And that'll just get them started right there. And then you can speed up a little bit more as you get more acclimated to the exercise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, then that water resistance. The really water adds resistance. The, yes. Yeah. So pushing and pulling the water works both ways, which is okay. amazing. Okay. 
Of course, there is a huge selection of equipment for water exercise. Let's show a few of the options as you explain their use. Our first graphic is a rainbow of pool noodles, which I love. <laughs> yes. So a lot of people think you're going by the color. You do not go by the color no. of the noodle. <laughs> no, no, you okay. go by the diameter at the end. And um, if you could show the next graphic, you'll see the ends of the noodles there. So on the bottom one, the yellow one, is the diameter is much bigger. And then the middle one is a little bit less in the diameter. And then the top one's the smallest. Okay. So. How I explain it to people, if you're a floater and you have a hard time getting your legs down, then you would be using a smaller noodle oh. because you're already a floater, so you want to use a smaller noodle for that. Most of them go with the average size one. The bigger one, if you're a floater, it's just going to float you back up higher. Oh. So if you're dense, like if somebody, like you take an athlete, I would give them the one with the bigger diameter because Interesting. they... It, but then also we can use our noodles. We stand on them, we put them between the legs, we uh, wrap them around our waist, we can put them out front. So any of these pieces of equipment that you will be seeing, you can use for upper, middle, and lower parts of your body. Okay. So that's how I break okay. it down. So we can use all those noodles. So somebody with um, weaker upper body, they might want to use that smaller noodle. Right. Somebody super strong would want to use a bigger one because you're going to get more resistance as you push it under the water. Well, it's important to use the correct equipment. I totally agree. Yeah, and yes. I had no idea there yes. was. So yeah, if you get into difference. a class, just ask the instructor or okay. if you just go to workout area. Sure, sure. Okay, then on to the kickboards, and again, we have varying sizes. Yeah, so again, you don't go by the color. <laughs> you go <laughs> by the width of the kickboard. Okay. So our, at our facility, the yellow is a little bit thinner, and so it's going to be lighter, and it's going to give more, more flexibility. The blue and the pink are denser, and so they're going to be harder to use. So we use these kind of the same way. I can put them between your knees and hold them. You can sit on them. You can use them for your arms hmm. and just push and pull and use it in the water. Okay, all right, very good. On to the barbells. A different sizes again. Yes, so you're gonna see a short little stubby one. That's gonna be a little bit harder because you're going to have a little bit thicker, denser on the ends of them. And then the other one is going to be a little bit lighter. Um, also, we put these behind your knees and do a lot. Of, we lock them in behind your knees and use them. We work on balance in every class. Okay. So I think that's hugely important at our age is to get some balance in. So we work on balance and we lock those in behind our knees. So uh, one of them you'll see you go wise one shorter. It's got a shorter handle. If you have a little bit thicker legs, you probably want to go with the one that's got a longer handle. It'll stay behind your knees better. Interesting. But they both work the same. It's just mm -hmm. a little bit of variation. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And then we just took a picture of your closet. <laughs> I tell you, there is no reason anyone should ever get bored with water aerobics. Do you have a few comments on what we're seeing there? Yeah, people are wondering, what are those things hanging over there? Okay, they are called water horses. And you just put them between your legs. You got a pad in the front, a pad in the back, and you can get in the deep water and pick your feet up and they will just hold you up and you just do a deep water workout. Oh. So they're water horses that you usually use in deeper water. The balls, just this is all just for variation of classes. The balls, we same thing. You can squeeze them between your thighs. We keep them a little bit flatter so they don't hurt when you push them under the water with your wrist. Mm -hmm. The bands in the middle, the yellow and blue ones, those go around your ankles. We can use them around your wrist. My and then goodness. the red bells, you can strap on your ankles or weights. Those will hold you down. They won't float you up. Okay. Ankle and wrist weights. Okay. All right. And then I can't remember if we had a second closet picture or not. I don't think so. Okay. That would do it then. Another exercise in the water then is the aqua track, which actually has a current of water flowing. Yes. So what is this? Good. That is treat. a huge selling point for okay. Madonna Proactive. Oh, I bet. <laughs> um, the water is about 94 degrees, 
and it's great for people with arthritis. If you have MS, it's probably not the best choice. You probably want to be in the lap pool where the temperature is about 84 degrees instead of 94. Okay. But people with arthritis, it feels really good. And the current runs about five miles an hour. It always runs the same direction. So we use it for physical therapy. We use it for classes. We use it for arthritis classes. Oh, we have okay. a class called Lifestyle Moves and it's really nice. We sh that's the only class we shut the current off on because most of those people have arthritis. Sure. Otherwise sure. we leave it on and you can get a great workout. <laughs> I, I'm certain of that. Are there some safety tips we should keep in mind? Well, I think it, depending on your health issues, you need to watch the temperature of the water. Okay. And um, our outdoor pool is running about 86 all summer long. Um, 80 four is the lap pool and then i just said 94 is the okay. aqua track right. and so as far as issues that's something you need to check with your doctor and make sure that they know that you're going to be starting a program okay all right do you have a recommendation for people who are a little bit afraid of the water but yeah. they'd like to try this good question yeah. yes i always suggest that you hang on to one of those noodles we were showing you for balance okay. and just start okay. walking if you want to try a class and you're nervous about it we put them next to the wall someplace in the shallow not so deep and that all depends on your height too okay so yeah mm -hmm. so we and just definitely. start slowly mm -hmm. it's easy to overdo and not yes. realize it yes yes you can get in and do a class and say oh this was great and then later that night you might not be too happy yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. so yeah you want to be careful start slow work up and just yeah okay all right so this as we stated earlier, this is a good form of exercise for certain medical conditions, arthritis in particular. Yes, arthritis is all the joints, so the inflammation in the joints, so it's very nice to be in the warmer water. I would not do cold water, it's okay, but they usually like it in about 88 degrees. So um, that's where our AquaTrack comes in and the warm water is really nice for mm -hmm. people with arthritis. Um, when you're doing water, for arthritis, you want that joint to be underwater. So okay. if you have shoulder problems, you're gonna want your shoulders under that warm water as you're working them. All of them are very easy movements. We don't, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. push. And you just, same thing there, you go through a form of exercises if you could be led by someone. If you have arthritis, ask somebody if you're at a facility or if you're mm -hmm. starting, just get in the warm water. How, how long do you think you should work in the water to realize benefit? Um, Time-wise, I usually <laughs> suggest five to six times a week and maybe um, go at least 30 to 45 minutes to start with. And then you'll start noticing benefits probably about six to eight weeks if you're consistent. Consistency is huge. Yes. So yes. try to be consistent. And in the water, you can do it every day. Okay. All right. Do you have a final word that might help someone get into this program if they're really anxious to try it? I would say start slow, start in shallower water. The deeper water you're in, the your more you're gonna feel your body floating. So if I'm in water up to my chest, which I suggest everybody try to stay chest deep water and get your workout so everything's under the water. Start slow, stay in shallow, work your way up, and then work slowly and then increase your time and your speed and your endurance. Okay, all right. And it's probably important to keep this going all year round if possible. Yes. It's easier in the summer outside. Yes, you want to be consistent. When winter hits, people do not think about getting in water and putting on a swimming suit. So my suggestion is put your suit on, put some clothes over it, put your coat on, get there. <laughs> Just get to the pool and you'll be fine and get in the water and you'll be so glad you did. Uh, and yes, I, I totally so agree much lighter, with that. <laughs> so much lighter under the water because right. you will notice it once you get out. Okay, all right. Julie Gibson, thank you so much for being on Live sure. and Learn and helping us dive into exercise today. <laughs> sure, thank, thank you. As we all continue to live and learn. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Welcome to Live and Learn.
a visit to a beautiful garden is a great one day outing from Lincoln. I'm Doug Joes. My guests today are Lois Luthi and Kim Reist, who are from the Humboldt Garden Club. And, and welcome to the program, ladies. And you're outside in the garden, which is great. Thank you. It's beautiful. Glad to see you, Doug. Now, Lois, uh, tell us a little bit, first of all, uh, sort of put us in location where Humboldt, Nebraska is. Humboldt is south of Nebraska City, about 50 miles, 45 miles, and south of Auburn, uh, about 20 miles. Um, we're clear down here in the southeast corner, uh, about five miles from the state line. It, it's a beautiful garden, and but it's not just a garden. It's a memorial garden. Uh, tell us how that came about. Well, the garden originated several years ago. A gentleman who is a dear friend of the humble community originally uh, wanted to put a memorial garden in place uh, for some friends he had lost here in Humboldt and his wife. Uh, Bill Lossman is from uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and he wanted to do something in their memory. Uh, but it didn't go through so well because we didn't have a garden club at that time. And Bill couldn't maintain it because he was in Louisville. And so the city council turned him down at that time. But that's where the original plan comes from. So it's, it's a memorial to all kinds of cancer victims. Is that correct? Yes, cancer victims, survivors, and those that are suffering with cancer at this time. And um, so the idea came from him. And then what was the process once uh, you, you got started? Did you then form a garden club to sort of take it from there? We did. In 2017, we formed a garden club. Uh, we went to the city council, asked for permission to use the space. It was overgrown, a lot of just little saplings, weeds. But we went to the city and asked for permission to establish the Cancer Memorial Garden. So and they approved that, willingly. So then the, the the Garden Club is sort of the the, the parent of of the of the, of the, the, the parent the design that is up now uh, that is in the garden now it was uh, made by Jan Wilhelm and she's the one who got it going again. Um, it had been several years and. Her family had lost some some family members to cancer as well. And she's the one who then put this design together and got us going uh, again. And it's not just um, garden per se in terms of uh, plants, but you also have uh, uh, some some figurines in the garden and, and uh, even some small little buildings. Tell us about that. <laughs> okay, the, the statues are all bronzes. They've all been donated by uh, people who have lost loved ones uh, to cancer. And we do have a couple in here of people who were big uh, contributors to the Humboldt area. And they also put a bronze in here because they knew that it'd be well taken care of. We have a fairy house um, that we built. Um, a lot of our buildings were built by Amish. And we also have a, a mill. And the mill has an original water wheel on it that was built back in the 50s and put in this specific area by our designer's grandfather. And so it has a little bit of significance that way as well. Now, from year to year, it's, it's a big job to get the garden planted and maintained. Uh, how is that accomplished? Is that... Uh, uh, due to the members of the garden club or how do you achieve that we do each one of the members takes an area a garden the bed within the garden here and you're responsible for planting it maintaining it all throughout the season and it's rewarding to watch the plants grow um, lois is very kind and grows all of our flowers from seeds or oh, wow. small plants. So we do all of that to keep our costs down. We try to do as much as we can that way. And so with each one of us taking a bed, we're able to kind of pick and choose based on some of our beds are designated to different types of cancer, whether it be breast cancer, lung cancer, and each one of those have a color. And so 
from there, we choose our color of what color we're going to plant in the bed. So that's that's a joint decision about the, the people who are responsible for that area then in the garden. The members, correct. No, I view. Sorry about the trains. <laughs> This this makes it real. <laughs> okay, uh, the uh, are you involved with any other cancer kind of organizations, or is this pretty independent? This is all independent at this time. We haven't been able to secure a connection with any of the other cancer different divisions that they have out. Whether it be, you know, the American Cancer Society, none of them. We haven't established a connection with them. We've been more on a tourism base. So, Kim, your your role, uh, or at least part of your role, is as a grant writer, and uh, so you you try to generate some funds. Uh, again, that that's a big deal, I would think, to generate the funds to uh, to support the garden. Yes, it's it's been a little bit more challenging with COVID. A lot of different grants weren't available or they changed their focus area. Uh, but we are continually applying for grants. Each and every month there's grants that go out looking for funds uh, just to help keep the garden going. Um, we also do fundraisers to help, you know, bring some money in until we get the grant money in. So that that's uh, an ongoing process. And you said you're now uh, just about four years old, so it's uh, you're, you're still in that that growing process. Yeah, it was it was uh, 19 or eight, 2017. Sorry, 2017 when we started the garden, and when after we got okay from the city, we started doing hardscape right away in that spring, and we had flowers planted by July. Uh, so it was a uh, it, it was a busy time. Now we're getting into a little bit cooler part of the year. Uh, what might visitors see then if they're uh, going to uh, go to the garden this fall? Well, we decorate for the harvest. So we oh, will okay. have, pump yeah, we decorate for harvest. So we will have pumpkins and ribbons and different straw bales and things like that around. We also decorate for Christmas. The place is completely lit up for Christmas. So it's even a good place to come oh. and drive through at Christmas time. So you have um, you have lights throughout the garden. Yes, we have a nativity scene. Every building has lights on it. Almost every flower bed has lights in it. Um, we have uh, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. We have Mr. and Mrs. Santa, and we even have a bridge. What about the plant material that, that might be available this fall? I, like I think of chrysanthemums, for example, as yes. a fall color. Yep, we have a lot. We have several perennials, but uh, yeah, our, our mums should be blooming this fall. Uh, we've got a lot of grasses that'll be in full color and full bloom by that time. Um, actually, our plants are a little slow this year because we had a cool spring, and so the plants really are just coming into their own right now. So, so uh, even with uh, the heat this summer, uh, it um, it hasn't um, damaged your your garden. Well, it's been a continuous watering issue. We, we, at this time, water a lot with hoses. We're under the, we're trying right now to get funds to put an underground watering system. Um, and we've got a pretty big area here. And by the time you water everything, it takes a, a long time to get around. And uh, so we're trying to get the, get the funds together for an underground watering system. Kim, you, you mentioned about... Uh the interaction with with the city to get this started what's been the support uh, over these four years from from uh, both the city fathers i might say and and also the the citizens of humboldt everybody really really enjoys the garden um, it brings a lot of tourism to the area so everybody's very much for that um, it also helps the businesses. So they're very appreciative of what we've done down here and, you know, really enjoy watching us continue the work. So they've, they've been supportive for us. The city has uh, been supportive uh, from a stand back kind of situation. They didn't want to have to take care of the garden. And so that's been their, 
their biggest thing is that they don't they don't we have our own we pay for our own water we pay for our own electricity we mow it ourselves and we pay uh all for our own insurance so um that's a cost that we have to take on and we chose to do that well lois and kim this has been a real pleasure to visit with you about this so before we leave though uh, tell us uh how we can find the garden if we when we get to Humboldt? Uh, the best way is to come down 105, uh, 105, turn off of Highway 4 onto 105, which is the main street uh, in Humboldt, and go south to the railroad tracks and hang a right. And you will follow the curvy road, the park road, right to the garden. Or and you can it, turn on 1st Street. The, the actual address is 1st and Park Avenue. And it's close to a, a large city park, too, so if people find that. Yes, it is. There's fishing and camping available there. In the summer, there's swimming, and there's there's all kinds of things. We love having people come down. We love sharing the garden. Yeah, again, thanks a lot for uh, visiting with us about this and, and also being out in the garden. This makes it a, a, a real interaction here. So, uh, Kim and, and Lois, thanks for uh, telling us about uh, the Memorial Garden in Humboldt.